welcome to Scovcast. I am here today with Dr. Shahon. Hi, how are you? Hi there, Eva. Thank you for pronouncing my name correctly. Not everyone manages it. You nailed it first time. Thank you. I didn't even have to ask you or anything. <laughs> I definitely didn't have to make sure. <laughs> well, anyway, you are a consultant forensic psychiatrist. Uh, I was wondering if you would explain a little bit about what that actually is for people who might not know. Absolutely. Yep. So a psychiatrist is a medical doctor who specializes in treating mental illness. And a forensic psychiatrist is somebody who does that, but specifically with uh, people who have committed serious violence or other types of offenses. So typically I assess people in either prisons or in courts or in these locked psychiatric units. So day to day, what does that look like for you? What does your job actually entail? Sure. So there's there's kind of two different elements to my job. There's the bit that I do mostly now, which is the expert witness work. So say somebody's committed a serious uh, offence, anything from arson to assault to even murder, and they're usually in prison on remand before their trial. So what I'll do is I'll go in and I'll assess them. I'll get all the information from like medical notes to case papers, CCTV about the offence itself, witness statements. And using all of that information, plus assessing the individual, I basically have to make a call about whether they're mentally ill or not. So do they have a mental illness? Yes or no. If so, did they have symptoms at the time of their crime? Yes or no. And if they did have symptoms, are they criminally culpable or not? And if they're not criminally culpable, which I have to say is actually the case in the vast majority of defendants that I see, then I have very little further role. They go down the path of uh, staying in prison. And if they are, if their symptoms take away their criminal responsibility, then I section them under a criminal section uh, into a secure psychiatric unit. So that basically sums up what I do in terms of the actual logistics. It's like one hour visiting somebody in prison and about seven or eight hours just sifting through reports and typing up on my on my laptop. So the the assessment is is the sexy bit, and my the conclusions of my report is also very interesting. But to be honest, there's a lot of paperwork around all of that. Yeah, I think in a lot of jobs as well, there's the bit that people don't see that isn't as glamorous. Even with YouTube, the majority of your time is editing a video. It's not recording and being really interesting, you know, so there's always that that hidden bit. But I can Absolutely. imagine the um, the speaking to, to these people is quite difficult because maybe some people might not want to give you all the information and then other people might be inclined to lie. Like, does that happen a lot? Yeah, absolutely. So you've you've summarized it perfectly. It's a whole range of presentations. So you get people on one end of the spectrum who are trying to who either are mentally ill but are open, or who are trying to fake mental illness. So they try and exaggerate uh, or even fabricate symptoms. And then on the other end of the spectrum, <clears throat> you get people who are genuinely psychotic. So as as you'll know, but for your viewers, people who are psychotic generally tend to have hallucinations or delusions. So they're either hearing like voices or they have these paranoid false beliefs about their safety. So those people are very hard to assess because they, you know, they've never met me before. They're not very keen to express their innermost thoughts and feelings to some chump who's just rocked up in a waistcoat that they've never met before. So yeah, it, for those people, it's a real struggle to elicit symptomatology. Yeah. I am wondering though, what made you want to go into this field specifically? I think a lot of people will be curious as what would drive you to want to work with these kinds of people? Maybe it's not really for everybody, you know? Yeah, I absolutely think it's not for everybody. Um, so I uh, I was always interested in criminality. So as a teenager, I'd listen to Gangster Rap from Snoop Doggy Dog to NWA to watching all these mob films. So I always had that just um, slight fascination with, you know, gangs and violence, but I never really realized or thought that I'd do that for a, for a living in the future. And then I went to medical school. So uh, something that often gets misunderstood is that psychologists specialize only in psychology and they don't train in, in general uh, physical health, whereas psychiatrists are doctors first. So I went to medical school. To be perfectly honest with you, Eva, I was never really that inspired by any of the placements, any of the attachments, any of the subjects that I did. I just kind of bounced around, just about crammed and got through exams. I, I never felt like a connection or a passion with anything until I discovered psychiatry. So my first experiences of psychiatry had nothing to do with offenders. It was just like general psychiatric wards. So typically I'd see people with say schizophrenia with, with very bizarre internal delusional worlds, or as I said before, hearing voices or uh, after like post suicide attempts when they'd taken certain overdoses. And I just connected immediately to, to speaking to people in those kinds of scenarios. So I think I, I the fascination of 
these really strange ways of thinking is what first got me into psychiatry. And then it was a few years after I started my psychiatry placements as a junior doctor that I kind of almost by accident stumbled into a six month forensic placement. So I was in a medium secure unit where everybody on the ward had committed some level of severe violence. And for me, it was the backstories. So every single person there had a reason that they A, became career criminals and B, had a mental illness. And it's often the same reason. It's obvious, often like poverty, drug use, uh, really lax parenting or neglectful parents or for, or suffering some form of abuse. So that's what really drew me in. It's, it's the backstories of every individual. Mm. I think uh, I said to you as well, just before we started, that I do want to, or I hope to go into forensic psychology at some point, which as you pointed out is different, but there are similarities. Um, and I think that wanting to understand the person behind these kinds of crimes is really just the driver like what would make somebody want to do this what are the reasons for it and Abs- i'm kind absolutely. of wondering yeah for you would it be kind of difficult you know working with these people and understanding the reasons perhaps they might have done some of this stuff and then also knowing what they've done do you find sometimes you have a bit too much compassion for the the patient in this case yeah um, so a few things I'd say there, first of all, for yourself and also for anybody that's interested in this field, I think it takes a certain kind of person. So I think if you're kind of interested in true crime and if you're in- interested in like the gory details, then that's absolutely a part of it. So that's what attracts people, I think, to, to this field. I think that you have to be very adapt to dealing with people who are quite dangerous and who can be aggressive. I'm not saying that everybody that I see all the time is aggressive, but absolutely there are people who, especially when inside these locked wards that can uh, lose their temper for a number of reasons. But sorry, I'm not answering your question. It's just a side thing that I wanted to say. Uh, But in terms of understanding the motivations behind their offending, again, it's a broad spectrum. So on what end of the spectrum, I would say there's people with pure mental illnesses. So they are people, for example, I've assessed um, a young woman who was hearing voices and had these paranoid delusions that led her to kill uh, her nephew. So her three-year-old nephew. So goes without saying absolute horrific, shocking crime, but she wasn't antisocial. She didn't ever offend or have any violence. She never had any kind of problems with this young boy or any members of her family previously. So you can understand that her actions were driven clearly by mental illness at that time. And on the other end of the spectrum, you, we have people with like personality disorders. So you've probably heard the term antisocial personality disorder, which is kind of linked with being psych- uh, with psychopathy. And those people are in control of their actions. They're habitual offenders. They lack empathy. They're impulsive. They're aggressive. They don't, they don't care about the rights of other people. So their motivations are very different from somebody like the, the young girl that I talked about. So it, it, the point I'm trying to make is, is it's very different the different people that that present in different ways have different motivations. And I think it's easier for me personally to have empathy and sympathy for the person in the first category, who's clearly stepping outside of reality, didn't realize for months or years afterwards what she'd done versus somebody with a personality disorder who, who's, you know, arguably built that way and wired that way, but still is in control of their actions. It's harder to have sympathy for them. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. I mean, if somebody's, Uh, dealt with a psychotic break then they come back and they know what they've done and they realize and they understand it would be a lot harder to not feel bad for that person and I I have heard you um, tell this story before of this girl and it's I can't even imagine how difficult that must be to suddenly be lucid again and know what you've done and there's nothing you can do to change it it's it's horrifying really yeah yeah it really was In, in her particular case so uh, I call her Yasmin when I've talked about her in other videos and in my book, that's not her real name. She was really strongly psychotic for a very long period of time. And it took months for us to, to find the right balance of medications to decrease or reduce those symptoms. And as you say, it took, a, it was very gradual, but like reality came crashing in. So for the whole time until the medication finally kicked in, she genuinely believed her delusion. So she believed that she hadn't really ended this young boy's life and she believed that there were demons inside of him, which is why she suffocated him. She believed she could reincarnate him. That she genuinely 100% believed that. So all these people, myself included, that were telling her otherwise, she didn't really listen to us. It didn't make sense to her. But over time, it, it over, and it wasn't like a, a one snapshot moment. It was a very gradual thing. 
the horror of what she'd actually done and how it affected her family came in. So then she went into this massive deep depression. And as you say, that was part of our therapy was trying to like pull her out of this through therapy and through medication. It just must be so difficult. But I, I do want to ask you as well, because you mentioned personality disorders. And I'm quite curious as to how prevalent would it be to see people with personality disorders that aren't antisocial personality disorder because we hear a lot about ASPD and we hear a lot about yeah. schizophrenia and things like that which obviously I, I do want to point out and as you would want to point out probably as well not everybody with those disorders are going to commit violent crimes but um, that is most of the coverage that we hear so is it common to see other people with different personality disorders, maybe BPD or something like that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, you, you've hit on a point and you've said it more eloquently than I can, but I still want to make the point that people, the vast majority of people with mental illnesses are not dangerous, but it's just that I happen to work with the cohort that specifically are. So people that are going through criminal trials uh, and people that have been sectioned to these secure units. So people in other general mental health wards by, by and large and not dangerous, but in my secure units they are. Um, so to answer your question, absolutely. So personality, there are lots of different types of personality disorder. You've mentioned antisocial, you mentioned borderline, you know, there's narcissistic, anancastic, uh, obsessive, but the ones that I see happen, the majority of them happen to be antisocial or borderline. So the other types of personality disorder don't tend to appear in the population that I see. So people in prison, people going through trials. And that's pretty logical when you think about it. So antisocial is all those things that I mentioned before, impulsive, aggressive, don't learn from their mistakes, don't care about rights and wrongs. So they are career offenders. So that is really high in the patient group I see. So in a, in a typical medium secure unit out of, say, there'd be maybe 25 patients, I would say, coming on to half of them will have a diagnosis of antisocial personality disorder. What's interesting, I think about borderline. So I'll just, again, I'm sure you know this, but for your viewers, I'll just very quickly explain what borderline personality disorder is. So it's people that tend to also be quite impulsive, but it's more of an emotional reaction. So they're not antisocial criminogenic people generally, but they cannot contain their emotions. So they have very turbulent relationships. They often have these explosive arguments. They're, you know, best friends with their family or their partner or their friends one minute and then turn around and, and you know, just absolutely hate them the next minute. So they're very unstable in their moods and their outlooks. They tend to self-harm and they tend to make really impulsive decisions from spending lots of money to taking drugs to being sexually promiscuous. So that's just all of that is part of their nature. So what's interesting about them from my experience is they don't intend to offend. They're not like career drug dealers or thugs like antisocial people are. They, they, they don't want to end up in prison, but when you put them in a certain circumstance, whether it's, you know, the 10th argument they've had with, with their boyfriend or girlfriend that day, they can't contain their emotions. So they, they explode sometimes with violence and then immediately regret it. Whereas the antisocial people, they don't really regret it. They regret being caught, but they don't regret their actions. I mean, me personally, I do have a diagnosis of BPD, um, which oh, really? I have been in therapy for many, many years. So I've worked on most of my symptoms. They're almost non-existent. So okay. I can sort of understand what would lead somebody to do something aggressive or violent. I haven't myself, but I yeah. could understand how it could happen. And then again, understand the regret that would come after that, because I know myself, if I've screamed at somebody maybe in the past, um, yeah. just because I couldn't control my emotions, I do regret it afterwards and I feel ashamed. So it, it makes sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the other thing I'd say is that that like all mental illnesses, the diagnoses, mental disorders, everything's on a spectrum. Right. So the people that I'm talking about are not necessarily representative of everybody with borderline personality disorder. It's just the ones that I see are the ones by definition that have committed violence. So that's why that's my clinical impression of them. Mm -hmm. It's not it's not the same for everybody. Oh, yeah, definitely makes sense. I do want to ask you as well. Um, a lot of my audience are in online mental health spaces and actually quite a few people in my audience have DID, dissociative identity disorder. And yeah. I am curious, um, well, first of all, your thoughts here, because I, as far as I'm aware, it's quite a contested disorder yeah. or diagnosis in general. Yeah. <laughs> That is a good, that's a good question. Interesting question. In fact, I'm, I'm, I'm right in the middle of writing an episode for my YouTube channel about exactly that. I haven't got around to finishing it yet. So uh, dissociative identity disorder is a 
I don't know if I could call it a hypothetical disorder. I think I think contentious is the right word. It's a disorder that's supposed to happen where somebody goes through a horrific level of repeated trauma from childhood, so much so that they disassociate themselves. So they they train their mind to step outside of reality almost as a defense mechanism, a, a denial of the reality that's going around them. And because it happens so frequently over time, it becomes like a, a habit. So these people jump between personalities. It's kind of a split personality disorder is, is the colloquial term for it. The reason it's contentious is that some psychiatrists think that it doesn't exist and that all cases are fabricated. To be perfectly honest with you, I've never seen a credible case in my career. And I've seen at least 10 to 15 cases where I'm convinced that somebody has faked it. So I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I'm saying I am an agnostic rather than an atheist. So if I do ever see a clinical case, which could happen, a credible clinical case, then I will believe it exists. But until then, I am skeptical only because I've seen so many people that try and fake it because it is something that you know, if you knew nothing about forensic psychiatry and you'd committed some sort of horrific act of violence, it's quite, if you want to try and cheat the system, which happens a fair bit uh, in the defendants I see, then it's an easy thing to, to try and pretend that happened. You know, the classic things are, doctor, these voices told me to do it, or doctor, it's another personality that I have that I can't control. So I think that's one of the reasons, especially in forensic psychiatry, when it's in the context of a criminal trial, where it, where it can be misappropriated or misused, which is why it makes it uh, so so controversial i think i did have another question about the did aspect of things but i'm just kind of curious and i want to ask you maybe i'm completely wrong here but from my understanding um if you end up in a, a psychiatric ward rather than in prison i don't think really that's always the better option is it uh, i suppose that depends on your perspective if you have a treatable mental illness that directly uh, directly affects your risk. So I'm, I'm take, I, as I often do, I'm taking it back to that case of Yasmin, the 18 year old who was psychotic, killed a nephew clearly because of a directly because of a psychotic symptoms. Then 100 percent, absolutely, in my opinion, a psychiatric ward is better for her because if she refuses medication, which she did in the secure unit, there's no way that it can be enforced on her in prison. Whereas in a hospital environment, you're allowed to, if necessary, as a last resort, use the Mental Health Act to enforce uh, medication on somebody like that, which might include giving them injections. Sounds harsh and it's, it's not a pleasant experience for anybody involved, but in cases like this, it actually changes her life. So over time, those medications can reduce their symptoms. So the point that she leaves hospital, she's at very, very low risk compared to when she committed her offense. So that's an extreme kind of example. But in those cases, absolutely, I think it's, it's best for somebody to be in a psychiatric unit. The cases where it's a real struggle is where you have somebody that's got a personality disorder or has both got a psychosis and a personality disorder, which is actually quite common to have both. And the reason it's, it's, it's hard for them is because, to be frank, for them to be discharged, they have to be, they ha they're almost pressurized or bullied to engage in this therapy and to behave in a certain way. So let, let me put it like this. If you're antisocial you, you've got a tendency to you know get into arguments or fights and if you're in prison as long as you don't do something really stupid like attack a guard or really seriously injure an inmate then you can continue with those beliefs your, those thoughts that that philosophy that agenda that way of life and come when your release date comes you get released back into the into the real world if you're in a psychiatric unit and you keep those behaviors. So if you test boundaries, if you push the limit, if you argue, not necessarily even assault people, but if you argue with people or you, you refuse to properly engage in therapy, then your discharge, there's not a finite discharge date. So you can end up staying in psychiatric units much longer than say the equivalent prison sentence. So if that's your situation, then I, I imagine absolutely you'd rather be in prison than you would in a psychiatric unit. Yeah. I was thinking, more for people who don't actually have a mental illness who are just faking it to try and get a more lenient sentence and then end up uh, in psychiatric care when they don't actually need it i could imagine that wouldn't be the better outcome although maybe maybe it is i don't know i haven't been in either of these spaces so i'm not really sure <laughs> Well, the one thing that I would say, Eva, is that it's really difficult, in my opinion, to fake mental illness and get into one of those units in the first place. <clears throat> I'll explain why. So uh, we've kind of alluded to the fact that it, that people do try their luck. And, you know, I don't blame them. If I was facing, you know, 20 years uh, in prison for murder, I'd probably maybe try and test the boundaries a little bit. But it's really easy to spot them. And I'll explain why. Firstly, because we don't just look at the presentation in front of us. So 
again in the case of Yasmin it's not just enough that she tells me about these delusions about you know demons and the voices she's hearing we look at all of the evidence so we look at witness statements of people that have that have been close to that person even witness statements of the victim uh, or the police when they arrested that person uh, we look at old medical notes psychiatric reports even after they've been put on remand so while they're in prison I would speak to the prison guards and ask about their presentation so somebody who's telling me that they're psychotic and they're you know have these paranoid delusions in the room sitting with me but is acting completely normally whilst they're in prison and talking and interacting in a different way with a prison guard makes me kind of suspicious and the other thing i'd say is that is that people who are genuinely psychotic as, as i touched on before they tend to be quite reserved and uh, you know paranoid so they are not gonna they're not gonna blurt out their intentions or uh, their agenda straight away whereas people who try and fake mental illness in my experience that they over egg it because they don't actually know what it really looks like. So they do things like, you know, they try and dribble or they rock or they tell me immediately they're hearing voices or they tell me about these paranoid ideas immediately, like when I've barely introduced myself. And that makes me suspicious because that is not how a truly psychotic person presents. So this is a roundabout way of saying that in my view, it's really hard. It's not impossible, but it's really hard to get into a psychiatric unit if you're faking mental illness. And once you're there, there's no reason for a doctor or a psychiatrist to keep you there if, if, uh, they think you're faking it so they'll either send you back to prison or discharge you because you're basically blocking a bed for somebody who needs it so if i rocked up and just started screaming the devil told me to do it you probably wouldn't think that i actually had some kind of mental illness well so it's, it's possible that you had a mental illness but it's also possible you're faking it so i would want to see all of that evidence if i was unsure so I won't bore you with the details because trust me, it's, it's really lengthy and uh, and very dry, but there are loads of different sections of the Mental Health Act. So you've got like a hospital order, which means I, as a psychiatrist, I've made the decision, this person definitely needs long-term treatment. Then you have like a section 48, which is a remand order, which means I, as a psychiatrist, I'm not fully sure, but I suspect they have a mental illness. So I section them to a psychiatric unit during their trial. And by the time of their trial, I need to make a decision, hospital or prison. So what I'm saying is if I was unsure, then there are uh, provisions under the Mental Health Act to do like a short term observation. So <clears throat> somebody faking voices is easy to do in an hour in a room with me, but to do it for like three or four months when they're being observed 24 hours a day by nurses is, uh, I wouldn't say it's impossible, but it's much, much, much harder. Yeah, I would say that's probably a difficult feat. You'd probably get a bit bored of it by the end and just be like, oh, this isn't worth it. Just... Just send me to prison. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. I am uh, curious then on the topic of faking and things like that, how much you know of the conversation going on at the moment about people potentially faking mental illness online, uh, especially on TikTok. It seems to be quite the hot topic in the media at the moment. Okay. I've heard bits and pieces. I think one of my friends mentioned it to me, but I've got to admit, Eva, I don't know much about it. Can you enlighten me, please? What What are they doing? Well, just the claims are that people are uh, mostly teenagers and older kids are faking different mental illnesses online. One of the big ones that these claims are made about is DID. There's also um, ADHD. People are saying people are faking autism. Um, Tourette's, although I don't know if that qualifies as a mental diagnosis. I'm not quite sure. Uh, maybe it's, you can remind me on that. It's technically a neurological diagnosis. I've never, another way of putting that is I've never both when I've worked in forensics with offenders and previously when I worked in my earlier training in general adult psychiatry, I've never seen somebody that's come in specifically to be treated for Tourette's, but I've seen people that have come in with really complicated, uh, different psychiatric and neurological uh, disorders where Tourette's has been comorbid, if that makes sense. So I've seen it, but that's not been the reason that they've actually gone into psychiatric units. Mm -hmm. um, but to go back to what you're saying, I mean, uh, I didn't know the details. I mean, I don't know what to say. That's really horrific. It's horrific. It's really, really disrespectful to people that have those mental illnesses. It's just a very cheap way, I think, of trying to get attention and, and to get clout. I mean, of course, not everybody online who has a mental illness is faking that mental illness, but you do see... Um... You see accounts and things like that. Obviously, I won't name any specific accounts because most of these are teenagers and things like that, but yeah. that are quite clearly just making things up. And it is quite sad to see. Um, I think it used to be back in back in my day, um, a much lower form of that, whereas everybody had clinical depression, which obviously a lot of people did have. But, you know, there was just a lot of people saying that they had a diagnosis of clinical depression and they were horribly depressed, whereas they may have just, you know, been a regular amount of 
teenage angst going on so yeah yeah I think it was, it all ties down to people just being a bit narcissistic um just wanted the attention really there's there's no other way to put it people will I think some not not people in general but some people will go to any lengths just to get a bit of sympathy uh, and they believe I think they conflate sympathy online with being like you know real life human connection which obviously it isn't um but it's a shame it's a shame that people will do that would you say the internet has made that need for attention worse absolutely absolutely so you said back in my day but i imagine i'm at least a couple of decades older than you so it's, i think i've got a unique perspective in that i didn't grow up with social media so uh, you know the internet vaguely existed when i was in my late teens but p- people didn't start using it regularly especially social media till i was in my say late 20s so i've not grown up with it but i've seen it as an adult and yeah absolutely i think it's just so easy for anybody to make content or put their opinions or make you know a short tiktok video where they as you say uh, pretend to have all these psychiatric diagnoses uh, and i think it's become part of the culture so it doesn't make sense to me because I, not me and none of my friends and none of my peers did it when we were growing up but i suppose if you're raised with all your friends around you believing that your online presence and the number of subscribers and followers and likes that you have is part of your identity. If you're raised with that and if everyone else thinks that, then it makes sense to me how other people think that, but I can never think that way because I'm just not used to it like that. If that makes sense. That does sound really peaceful, actually. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm still a YouTuber and I still, I still, you know, crave attention to a degree, but it's not my, it's not my, it doesn't, it doesn't act as my social life. This is just something that I want to do for my YouTube career. I don't, I, you know, I have my friends and and I care much, much more about seeing my friends, my opinions of my friends than anybody online. So it's not as if I don't I crave any media attention, but I, I have a very distinct boundary of, of what I know is real and what's not real. I mean, I didn't grow up with, you know, social media the way it is now, obviously, but I did still have social media maybe from the time I was 12 or 13. And yeah, I can definitely see how, I guess because I was old enough then to kind of see the change because kids now are, they have internet their whole lives. Like they've always seen social media and they've had social media accounts from the time they're eight, which I feel like parents should not allow that, but I'm not going to tell parents what to do with their children. That's their children. (laughs) But it is quite, um, yeah, it is just quite a whole different space and it's, it can't be good for your brain at all. (laughs) It yeah really yeah can. especially especially when you start that young right so you said that you that social media kind of existed as a thing when you were 12 i think it probably existed f- when i was in my mid 20s but i certainly didn't pay any attention until my mid 30s but i didn't really pay att- that much attention until i started my youtube channel it's only a couple of years ago I'm, I'm in my 40s now but the point i was trying to make is that you can see if you're a 12 year old you're very vulnerable to outside influences you know if a random stranger insults a 12 year old then that can actually be really kind of hurtful and shameful for a stranger attacks a mid 20 year old that you've never met online you know it's some people are going to take that personally but the vast majority of, of mid 20s or mid 30s people are just can think like who is this idiot and then just immediately dismiss it but you know a 12 year old is extremely vulnerable i guess it depends as well on the person growing up sorry my phone is beeping in the background apologies to everybody it's that social um, media is getting you it's getting you <laughs> It actually was as well. Oh no, (laughs) thought my phone was on silent. Damn, it caught me out. I was pretending to be so holier than thou. I don't, I don't care about the internet. (laughs) But yeah, I guess it would depend on the person grow, not growing up, but once you're older, how much it affects you. And then I'm, I am curious, you know, if you grew up with the internet, how much more it may affect you later on. Like if you grew up from the ages of eight on instagram or on tiktok or something and then by the time you're 20 your whole sense of self is dependent on that would the words of people online affect you more i don't know it's it it's an interesting conversation absolutely and this this is going to sound i imagine a weird thing for you to hear um but when facebook etc first came out a lot of us me i'm talking specifically with my friends we thought it was kind of lame you know, because now everybody has an account and now everybody has an online presence, but we kind of associated the first people that are really into it. You know, the first people that had a Facebook account, the first people that are sharing their photos, we thought of them as kind of a little bit nerdy. You know, we didn't think it was something that was going to catch on that everybody, myself included, will be doing in like a decade or two decades time. Uh, so I suppose the point I'm trying to make is just the actual concept of it all has, has completely shifted in society massively. 
It was even the same for YouTube as far as I remember. YouTube was seen as just some weird thing that kind of nerdy people did. Yeah, and it was, made it was for people that, that didn't have friends in real life. That's how it was seen. I'm not saying it is like that now. I, you know, I'm a, I'm a fledgling, struggling YouTube myself, so I'm not saying that's how I think about it now, but that's honestly how I thought about it when it, when it first came out. Well, since we're already mentioning YouTube, I would like to, um, to talk a bit about your channel. So do you want to tell people what you do there? Sure. Yeah, I'd love to. So it's called A Psych for Sore Minds. And it's basically a cross section of anything to do with offending and mental illness. So sometimes I look at really high profile cases. So recently, like um, R. Kelly, Jeffrey Epstein, uh, Jimmy Savile, um, Tim Westwood, stuff like that. And sometimes I look more at cases that are not necessarily driven by trends or by celebrity, but are just interesting to me. So various serial killers, or I mentioned the case of, of that young girl, there's a really similar case of a woman called Andrea Yates, who was completely psychotic and tragically killed her five children in 2001, again, in a very similar manner due to these delusions and these voices. So I kind of dissect my opinion on her psychiatric defense in her criminal trial. So yeah, it's just those kind of topics. It's a bit sort of informal, I try and make it funny where I can. Uh, I think some of my jokes fail, but uh, occasionally a uh, small percentage of them work. So yeah, I'd encourage your viewers to to come and check it out. Yeah, there will be a link and all that for people to check it out. But um, don't worry, by the way, about jokes failing. Um, I don't claim to be funny at all. So <laughs> I do try. I, I think that I'm hilarious and I laugh at my own <laughs> jokes and my sister finds me funny. But beyond that, nobody else. Nobody else. <laughs> so, well, you've got you've got one one more person that thinks you're funny than I do. So you're beating me. <sighs> Well, at least I've gotten that much. <laughs> but um, I am wondering, I don't think you had anything on your channel about this, and maybe that's because it's not quite in your sphere. I'm wondering how much you know about the Free Britney stuff. Uh, a little bit. I don't know about much what's happened recently, but I actually saw a documentary. I think it was called Free Britney. Um, it was quite a while ago, so it was about her conservatorship. Actually, I did make a video about this on my channel. Um, again, it was quite a while ago is when I was very first starting. And for what I remember, my thoughts at that time were basically, it didn't make sense to me how we're saying that she needs conservatorship. So we're saying that she doesn't have the capacity, the mental capacity to make decisions for her, uh, for on her own behalf about like her finances and how to spend her money. But she's also going out occasionally to award shows, recording albums. So, so I... I as part of my expert witness work, I very occasionally do capacity assessment. So say somebody's got dementia and they've written a will, did they understand what they're writing in the will? That's the kind of question I have to answer. Again, interviewing the patient, looking through the evidence. So having done a number of those, it, I don't think that's possible. I don't think it's possible for somebody to be that cognitively incapacitated. They can't make day-to-day -day decisions and still function as a recording artist so that was my thoughts at the time I, I know that she's been in the news recently is that because the conservatorship has been reversed or cancelled right? um yeah it was ended and now there are some i'm not fully up to date on what's happening but there's some stuff to do with her father whether he's going to be charged with anything for um for abusing the conservatorship or for allegedly taking money from her when he shouldn't have and there's also yeah. stuff about him monitoring her uh, without consent and things like that so yeah um, there's always stuff in the media about her and also she's releasing new songs so it's she's quite yeah. big in the media at the moment for that as well yeah i mean i think she probably did have a breakdown at one point and i'm sure we all have the image etched in her mind where she you know had a shaved head and was was uh, just getting really distressed and agitated at all these paparazzi. Uh, but two things. First of all, I think that's understandable in the context. I think she was constantly hounded at that period of time, number one. And number two, just because that one thing happened such a long time ago, that doesn't reflect her mental state now. You know, people get agitated for whatever reason, you know, people without any kind of psychiatric diagnosis that happens to all of us all the time. You know, we can all lose our temper or do something out of character once in a very set of specific set of circumstances that doesn't mean that we can't function normally the next day or even a few hours later so i, I take issue with it with it all mm -hmm. i mean you've made a lot of the arguments that people make and that i agree with as well that it doesn't really make sense that the conservatorship started after she had this apparent breakdown which if you look at what was happening to her at the time she was being constantly hounded she was never left yeah. alone um i think she had at that time two small children so there's just a lot going on that probably would have really broken anybody. Um, and then to see her then years later working and doing interviews and all of this yeah. perfectly normally, but then to be told 
that there's something wrong and she can't look after herself. It just doesn't make sense. Obviously, we don't actually know um, what kind of diagnosis she has, if any, and we're not entitled to know that if she doesn't want to release that. But it is just, even without knowing that, it doesn't really make sense. Yeah. Totally but it is um, yeah. definitely interesting to get your perspective as a, a professional in the field more than just, you know, the rest of us here just kind of assuming and seeing what we think about it. But um, back to your channel then and your career more so than your channel. Uh, you've managed to get in quite a lot of shows and documentaries and I think you were on This Morning recently. How how has that happened and what's it like for you? <laughs> um, honestly... Uh... I think this speaks very much to my personality and my character. It's frustrating because I'm trying to break through and I have been doing little bits and pieces here, but I don't feel like I'm doing anywhere near as much as I want to and as I'm capable of doing um, because I, I genuinely think I've got a lot of interesting stories, you know, from all the patients I've seen, all the cases, and there are quite often new stories that are related to my line of work, either purely mental illness or purely criminality or like a cross section between the two. I mean, we've mentioned some already, you know, from R. Kelly to the So Murderers. So the, the, the So Murders, the anniversary was 20 years last week. So it's frustrating to me because in my mind, there are all these things that I want to comment on and I'm just struggling to, to kind of break through. But I think from, from so I've got an, a media agent and bless her, I give her such a hard time because I'm constantly hounding her for more opportunities. <laughs> um, and, but from her perspective and possibly other people, it feels like I'm getting on a lot. Um, but yeah, that's what I want to do. I want to I want to kind of grow in that space. Um, it's, it's difficult because it is really, really competitive. And I think there's a lot of noise and a lot of people who who want to do it as well. So I don't I haven't quite solved how to get there yet, but I am doing little bits and pieces. I, I might be on this morning again this coming Monday. Um, but my experience is that there's a lot of phone calls and then sometimes you just kind of get bumped at the last minute. So I'm not I'm not counting my chickens before they've hatched. Well, from an outsider perspective, it seems like you're doing pretty well for yourself. I mean, I do understand the um, the internal wanting to be doing more. I definitely do that all the time. And then seeing people in the same field as me being YouTube, I said that like I do something like really academic, but uh, people on YouTube with, you know, similar viewers and things like that doing way more than I am. I'm like, hmm, <laughs> why am I not doing these things? So I, I definitely get it. But you did say as well. Um, sorry. I was just going to say it speaks to our insecurities, isn't it? I, I definitely yeah. speaks to mine. Yeah, absolutely. Always want to be doing more, always want to be the next person up there. I think a lot of us do. I mean, some people are quite content with, you know, just doing what they're doing. And I think I envy those people a little bit. They just seem <laughs> so happy. But I think for any of us who maybe do YouTube or media in any way, there's definitely, you know, you can't do that without wanting to progress in those kind of areas. You don't just do it because you're content to make a video for one person. Yeah, absolutely. And I think for me personally, I'm not, I don't want this to turn into like a, a big sub story. Uh, I'm not trying to uh, wring simply out of your viewers, but for me, it feels harder because my life is so busy, you know, so my, I've got, you know, a full-time NHS job. I work as an expert witness on top of that part-time, <clears throat> I've got a wife and kids trying to exercise every day. So it's already really, really packed. So when I do things like constantly try and pitch for ideas to get on TV or make YouTube videos, there's a big voice inside of me saying you don't need to do this you know you're already making a living you don't need all this media attention you know it's just your narcissism you can just calm down <laughs> and shut up and just carry on with the rest of your life but another part of me sort of it tries to it tries to negate that voice and tells me that I want to be doing more and it's a constant battle between the two I suppose versus somebody who's like doing this stuff full-time or is, is YouTube full-time where it's literally they need to do it to you know to pay their bills I think it's very different it's, I suppose what I'm trying to say is it's 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 easier. The temptation for me to just quit is easier, I think. Well, I think you're doing well. I honestly do. Thank Outside you. of perspective, you've been in a lot of stuff. Uh, you've written a book as well, which I do want to talk to you about. Um, but you've been doing a lot. But you said you have um, interesting stories and stuff that you want to tell. Uh, so would you like to grace us with one of them? <laughs> okay, yeah, absolutely. So I think I've already mentioned Yasmin uh, quite a lot. So I'll give you a choice either. Do you want to hear about the most kind of gruesome form of self-harm that I've ever seen? Or do you want to hear about a case where I think a con artist has gotten away with faking mental illness? Oh God, I want to hear about both of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. I, th 
Oh, see, I, I think I'd be more inclined to hear about the self-harming story, but I think my audience would be more interested in the con artist. So why okay, I'll tell you, you what, let's, should, we, should, should we, should, I'll, I'll do them both. I'll give you a short version of, of both of them. <laughs> so um, they, these are cases that I've, I've personally assessed uh, for, as an expert witness for criminal court. So the con artist was a young woman. So <clears throat> in my book, I've called her Darina. That's not her real name. And she, she was actually a Ukrainian and she used to be a model she was very privileged very rich so she grew she grew up uh, like learning ballet learning the piano so she's very different demographically from most of the people that i see uh, and she also was married to a ceo of a company so she and her husband were multimillionaires. she kind of broken the relationship with her with him they got divorced and they had a few young children so basically what happened was that she was involved in these carbon credit scams along with her cousin was one of the co-defendants and also this other man who she used to work with who she had an affair with was another co-defendant and those two men did the vast majority of the scamming so they set up all these fake meetings and make, made all these fake, fake documentations whereas Darina she sort of siphoned the money so she opened various bank accounts and kept moving the money around to try and uh, hide the paper trail and basically they, they eventually all got caught and there was this uh, trial at the Old Bailey and the two men were both charged and, and found guilty and sent to prison. And halfway through Darina's trial, her son, uh, who I think was about three years old at the time, developed this really rare form of leukemia. So he was really ill. He was almost at death's door. So for very understandable and very reasonable uh, reasons, in my view, her trial was uh, stayed. So it means it was stopped to be continued the next year. Uh, the young boy luckily made it. So he went into remission for his cancer. And then she was due to stand trial again the following year. And she completely refused to engage with the trial process. So she ignored letters from her solicitors. When they eventually got her on the phone, she was really, really tearful, really upset, and just basically refused to answer any of the questions. So then her solicitors asked a forensic psychiatrist, not me, to do an assessment of her. And this person, who I will not name, but he's very renowned in my world. His, his literally his name is on the on the spine of all the textbooks that I uh, that I buy but never read uh, he assessed her and he believed that she was unfit to plead so she said he said that she was so upset so distressed so depressed that she was unable to go through the court process unable to understand the evidence etc etc so the trial basically should be dropped that's what he was suggesting and then the cps the crown prosecution service obviously smart bullshit so they asked for a second opinion so they instructed me to go and see her and right off the bat, I have to say that I felt something was off. There just was an inconsistency in how she was presenting. So, for example, she was extremely tearful and extremely reluctant to engage. But I think the difference is I didn't just let her get away with it. So whereas I think the other psychiatrist kind of tried his best, gave up eventually after 10 minutes of crying, I kind of sat there and let her cry out. And eventually the tears stopped and then she became very passive aggressive and she was able to communicate. But what was really interesting to me is that she was able to understand and give me answers to and give an account of loads of different parts of her history. So she could tell me about her childhood, her previous relationships, her, you know, psychiatric family history, all the stuff that you have to do repeat, routinely in a psychiatric assessment. But when it came to the offence, she suddenly couldn't remember anything. So she couldn't even remember the basics. She couldn't tell me that it was an offence of fraud. She couldn't even tell me if any family members were involved, even though her cousin had gone to prison. She couldn't tell me the name of the other co-defendant that she had an affair with that she used to work for, which to me just didn't, it just didn't add up. And then when I pushed her, she just carried on crying. So basically what I wrote in my report was that I think Darina is not, uh, is, is intentionally not engaging with this assessment. I think on balance, she is fit to plead, but she's choosing not to answer these questions. So I put in this report and I made it sort of diplomatic and I handed it into the judge. And to my surprise, that absolutely blew my mind. Despite my evidence, the judge overruled me and went with the other psychiatrist's evidence. So I think I can't prove this 100 percent, but I'm fairly convinced that he already the court already had the two main perpetrators in prison. So they were already sort of happy that they won the case. She was just like, you know, a smaller fish. Let's put it that way. And I think they, they didn't like the idea of putting a woman who had an ill child, which she did through a court case. And that's absolutely fine. I even wrote in my report that there are humanitarian reasons to end this trial. But from a psychiatric perspective, she is, in my opinion, fit to plead and she is faking it, basically. Uh, so I think the judge used mental illness just like Darina did to uh, excuse and to, to stop court proceedings rather than humanitarian reasons. And yeah, so I basically think that she got off with a multi-million pound fraud. Jesus. <laughs> Well, it just shows you how complicated all these procedures are. It's not really just, yeah, this person uh, is fit to plead, that's it, they're going to jail. It's not like that at all. 
Yeah, yeah. And it kind of it shows you how impotent somebody like myself can be if if you, if I'm convinced that I'm right, but I can't I can't, you know, overturn a judge's decision. Wow. Do we have time for your other story then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you if you're up for it. <clears throat> so I'll probably give you a, a trigger warning to some of your viewers. So this is pretty horrific. Uh so there was a man who was in his mid-50s, I believe, at the time I assessed him, it was a few years ago. So he'd already committed his uh criminal act and he was already in prison. So it was a relatively minor act. It was arson. So he set fire to the house that him and his girlfriend were living in uh, when he was drunk because he was depressed, had relationship problems. Nobody got hurt in the fire, but it was quite a big fire. So he had a relatively short prison sentence of a few months. Uh, and whilst he was in prison, he just didn't fit in. He just, he didn't, he wasn't built for prison. He was like, you know, a geeky kind of scared, slightly nerdy guy. He was bullied straight away. Um, basically the other inmates just took a dislike to him and they started bullying him. And a few of them started spreading these false rumors. So they said that he was in prison for a uh, sexual offense against a child, which is completely not true. And they also said that he'd set this fire and that his girlfriend died, which is also not true. And as you'll probably know, there's like a hierarchy of offenders within prison and people who are seen as who, those who commit uh, offenses against children or women are like at the bottom of the hierarchy. So he was basically targeted and bullied. He was you know, beaten up on several occasions. He was kind of, the prison guards tried to protect him by putting him on the vulnerable prisoner's wing, but he still, they still managed to access him. And basically he turned psychotic uh, very, very quickly. And that's really unusual for, for to happen to somebody in their fifties. Psychosis usually starts in your like late teens, early twenties. But I think he was just under such incredible stress. And then this comes to the horrific bit. In his delusional mind, he was convinced that the other prisoners wanted to eat his eyeballs because they, they would give them superhuman powers and they'd be able to smash out of the prison. That's what he believed to be true. And he thought the only way that he could possibly survive this is and, and stay alive is if, if he removed his own eyeballs in prison. So that's basically what he did. So he was already locked in this um, in the in the segregation, sorry, in the healthcare units. He's already locked in a little cell. And he had this little plastic knife and he, he basically removed his eyeballs. You know, the, the knife snapped within within the first attempt and he had to use his fingers for the, for the second eyeball. And this was all witnessed by a, uh, a nurse who was working at the prison at the time. And she very reasonably didn't feel safe to go in. So she had to call for backup and all the prison officers had to get kitted up. So that's the phrase where they all go in their riot gear. And it took about seven or eight minutes, which I think in, in the circumstances is actually very reasonable to, to get all those people in, get all the gear out and open the cell door. Um, so a lot of, it's quite a complex task to organize. So that happened and they all went in. By the time they actually opened the door, he was obviously completely blind, bleeding out or semi-conscious, got taken to hospital. So all of that happened. And then I saw him about two years after that. So he'd been released from prison. He was living in a care home, completely blind, obviously, wearing sunglasses during the assessment, in case you're wondering. Um, and basically, he was trying to sue the prison mental health team for not assessing him thoroughly enough, not recognizing his psychosis and not preventing that event happening. So what, what my role was, was to kind of look at the quality of the assessment. Now, all of what I explained happened on a Saturday afternoon, and he was actually assessed by a, a mental health nurse, another one, on the Friday afternoon. And I was trying, I was trying to be as honest and, and objective and neutral as I could be. And I thought that the assessment was pretty weak, to be honest with you. Like, I think the nurse probably, I didn't say this in my report, but I imagine that it was a Friday afternoon, nurse just wanted to get home. So they did a very perfunctory kind of risk assessment. And that man, he did definitely have some psychotic symptoms. So, for example, he was talking about how some of the other inmates were chanting uh, like all this black voodoo magic the, the night before, which wasn't true. Like the nurse checked with the prison officers, definitely wasn't true. And he had some very other strange behaviors. Like he was kind of cowering behind a toilet. So his argument was that it should have been picked up and he should have been transferred to somewhere safer and he should have been treated. And if those things happened, he wouldn't have become psychotic, wouldn't have removed his eyeballs. And I kind of feel for the guy because obviously that's a horrific situation to have been in. But objectively looking at the assessment, first of all, even though the assessment was quite weak, he categorically denied any intention of harming himself at the time. So they did do a risk assessment. It was a, it was a bit of a poor effort, a risk assessment, but they, they still did do a perfunctory one. And crucially, even if he did get picked up, it wouldn't have been an urgent case. So he wouldn't have been seen anyway, even if he was thought to be psychotic until the Monday. And even if he was seen as an urgent case, 
if they started treatment, it probably wouldn't have happened until the next day because it takes that long for the for the pharmacy to sort out the antipsychotics. And even if he did get the antipsychotics straight away, as you might know, it takes about four to six weeks before the actual antipsychotic effects work. You get a sedative effect within a few hours, but that wouldn't, I think, in my opinion, have changed the outcome. So unfortunately for him, but you know, in my objective and honest opinion, even though what happened was horrific, he didn't have a case, a civil case to try and sue the prison because even though the assessment was poor, the outcome couldn't have been prevented in my view. You would have to be so <laughs> convinced and so terrified to be able to do something like that to yourself. Like that would hurt, like to put it lightly, <laughs> that would really hurt. So you would have to be like, this is the only way you can survive to be able to do yeah. that. So taking yeah. the horrificness out of it, which it is very obviously horrific, it is, it's a very interesting insight into psychosis, I think, this story. Yeah, absolutely. Would I be right in saying then that people could perhaps hear more of these kind of insights in your book? What, what a brilliant segue, Eva, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> so uh, so my book is called In Two Minds. Oh, copy of it somewhere. So yeah, it's called Into Minds. It was released in March and it's basically like uh, my professional memoirs. So I talk about my most interesting, shocking, gruesome cases. But even though I kind of, I I myself am kind of fascinated by the lurid and the gory details, and a lot of that is in my book. I also try and focus on the rehabilitation process, on what I basically do behind the behind the scenes of trying to make people safe again, because I think that often gets forgotten. So yeah, mm -hmm. all of those, and it's slightly autobiographical, um, slightly funny, I think, and it's yeah, go and buy it. Well, I will say I did actually read it, and I absolutely oh, really? loved it. So I I would recommend it to my viewers. Absolutely, it is a fantastic book. I really do love these kinds of books, and I was looking for one for ages actually before um I found you and knew I was going to do this interview. So it was just a, a happy coincidence that I was able to read it. But besides That's that, very kind um, of you. thank you. Yeah, of course. Besides that, though, where can people find you? Um, that's it really I, I am am on other social media but I very rarely check it to, to be honest I have somebody that does it for me so the best place is uh, on YouTube so I do answer my YouTube comments um, and I love I, I put in a lot of time and effort answering my trolls because I think it's hilarious so yeah um, <laughs> either positive or negative if you comment on my YouTube videos then I will see it and I will respond if I have the time lovely well thank you so much for doing this this was really interesting maybe in the future we can have another chat or something like that this is great Absolutely, I'd love to. Thank you for asking interesting questions, Eva. It's appreciated. Of course. of course. Thank you for watching today's episode of Scovcast. If you enjoyed it, please feel free to like, leave a comment and share it around. And you can also subscribe and turn on all notifications to keep up to date with new videos. And of course, today's episode will also be available on Spotify and anywhere else you listen to podcasts. So feel free to follow those pages too. And finally, I just want to ask that you follow the Scovcast TikTok page and you can also follow me on social media at Vangelina Scov everywhere. Plus there is also a Patreon and YouTube memberships. You can find those linked in the description. Have a wonderful day.